Welcome to part five of our six part series of lectures on the nervous system. In this video, we're going to look at the structure and function of some regions of the brain. There are four major anatomical areas in the human brain, so four major structural areas, but there are many different functional regions. So from the outside and perhaps even looking through the microscope, it may not be possible to tell what a particular area does, um, but by looking at patterns of brain damage in people who have traumatic injuries or stroke, and by electrical recordings from the brain, we do know that different parts of um, the brain within these four regions have different functions. So first we have the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the human brain. Then we have the diencephalon, which as I said in the last video, means second inner brain. Next we have the cerebellum, or the tiny brain. And then finally we have the brain stem, which extends into and is continuous with the spinal cord. This is an example of uh, a partial mid-sagittal section through the head. So let's take a look at the lobes of the cerebrum. There are four lobes, right, and this is anterior, so the front of the brain, this is posterior. We have the frontal lobe shown in blue, and the frontal lobe is sort of the, the place where higher order functions of our brains occur. What's referred to as the prefrontal area is considered to be the site of executive functioning in the brain. So planning, delaying gratification, um, adulting, think of it that way. Um, the parietal lobes are primarily concerned with what's referred to as somatosensory information. So remember, soma means body, and you, so you've got sensations of the body. Representation of touch, pain, how our different body parts are related to one another as well. Representation of motor areas are in actually at the very back of the frontal lobe. More about that in a sec. The occipital lobe is where essentially what where we see. Our eyes are the, the organs of sensation, but we don't perceive anything visually without the occipital lobe of the brain. And then finally we have the temporal lobe, which it's called the temporal lobe because it's around your temples. Um, and it's, it has a lot of different functions, but you can associate it primarily with hearing. What we call the cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the brain, which is the, the gray, what's referred to as the gray matter. And that's where you find the cell bodies, the soma of neurons, as well as glia, as, and the axons of unmyel, unmyelinated neurons. One of the things to notice about this is a frontal section through the brain. Um, remember I said that in the previous video that the brain is sort of inside out in the sense that the cell bodies are on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. With a stain that's used in this, um, in this image, it stains um, DNA within cells. So you can see, you can actually see where the concentrations of neurons are. The other thing I would point out is that you can really see when you look in a frontal or even a sagittal section how wrinkled the brain is. And this pattern of sulci and gyri um, 
the indentations uh, are, the, are the sulci is an adaptation to increase surface area, which is generally the case whenever you see something that's folded in biological structures. It's often a way of increasing surface area. And the reason why that's important is that if you look really closely, you can see that within the cortex, there are distinct layers of cells. My pencil isn't thin enough to draw over that. Here's why that's important. Those distinct layers make up processing units. And the processing units run from the top of the gray matter down through six layers of cells into the white matter. So imagine if we didn't have all of these bumps and divots on the brain, we'd have this amount of surface area as opposed to all of the additional processing power we get. And in fact, the more intelligent species have more highly folded cerebral cortices. So the cortex has functional areas. So you've got lobes of the cerebrum. Each lobe has the, the cell bodies organized in these layers, which are referred to as the cortex. Cortex, by the way, means bark. And it's another common term when describing anatomical structures for the outer layer of something. So we've got the primary motor area, which is right at the back of the frontal lobe voluntary control of skeletal muscle. As you may know from if you've ever been around someone who's had a stroke on one side of their brain, the right side of the brain is responsible for muscles on the left side of the body and vice versa. The primary somatosensory area that represents bodily sensation um, not feelings as in emotion, but feelings as in the surface of your body or sore muscles, those kind of feelings. That's located at the very front of the parietal lobe. So the primary motor area and the primary somatosensory area are adjacent to one another, but they're separated by a sulcus. Then we have association areas in the in all of the four lobes of the cerebrum and those are places where integration of information happens and then finally we have processing centers which are even more advanced in terms of the kind of neural signaling that goes along and examples of those are Wernicke's and Broca's areas, uh, both of those are involved in speech. So this is, on the, on the bottom of this image, we have a mid-sagittal section of the brain. And you can see that at the very back of the frontal lobe, there's a slice of what we call primary motor cortex. And if we take a slice through that, and lay it sideways, we see that there is a, what's referred to as a motor homunculus. A homunculus means a homunculus is a tiny man. Um, on the parietal side, we have the a sensory homunculus. So the underneath motor homunculus and sensory homunculus, you can see frontal section left side, frontal section right side. That doesn't mean frontal lobe. It means the frontal or coronal plane of section. Okay, so the sensory homunculus is in the beginning of the parietal lobe. And you can see that the size of each part of the body is represented on this map, and this is how it actually works. The size of the body part that you see in the diagram uh, 
represents how much area the brain devotes to either controlling that part of the body for the motor side or representing that part of the body for the sensory side. This is the tongue, by the way. Um, so our hands and our faces and our tongues are the most highly controlled and highly innervated, the most sensory nerve endings of any place in our body. So this is a lateral view of the brain from the side right here. This is anterior and posterior. So we've got the occipital lobe, the back of the cerebrum. Primary visual cortex is where the information first is sent in terms of where does it go, where does visual information first go um, when it reaches the cerebrum. Then you have visual association areas at a little distance from that where different parts of our visual experience are put together. With the frontal lobe, which I'll outline here, this brain is oriented slightly differently than um, so that you can see more of the temporal lobe than the previous one. That's something always to be cautious about when you're identifying different lobes of the brain. Um, make sure that you're not learning something just with the brain turned one way or another. Look at a lot of different images. Back to the frontal lobe. So we've got primary motor cortex right where you right next to what's called the um, central sulcus which is between the two lobes then you've got somatic motor cortex which is an association area prefrontal cortex which is what it, the area i was talking about with uh, respect to executive functioning and Broca's area, which is associated with production of speech. In the parietal lobe, we've got primary somatosensory cortex. And then we have association areas, right? And part of the parietal cortex is involved in our ability to understand speech that area crosses over into the temporal lobe, which a lot of people describe as kind of the thumb <laughs> of the brain, if you hold your hand the right way. So you've got primary auditory cortex. So that's where sound information first comes into the cerebrum. Then you have auditory association area You've got our ability to understand speech in Wernicke's area, right? Um, and then a lot of other associative areas. On to the, our second inner brain, the diencephalon. In the small diagrams on the upper left of your screen, um, you can see the diencephalon outlined in yellow. The brainstem is the red. So there are three basic parts we would like you guys to remember about the diencephalon. First is the thalamus. And there are actually two thalami, one on either side. It's kind of hard to see in a mid-sagittal section, which is why I put the outline there. Um, the thalamus is a relay station. So each thalamus is a mass of nuclei, cell bodies, that receive sensory input of all types, somatosensory, visual input, auditory input, um, and the only input that doesn't directly go to the thalamus before going to the cerebrum is information about smell. The very back 
of the thalamus, the thalami, nestled into the groove between them is a very tiny structure called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which is involved in syncing our body's activity with day length. And then last but not least, we have the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is um, both an endocrine organ and a neural organ. Um, it is a bridge between the endocrine and the nervous system. It's made of neurons that uh, produce special proteins that actually allow them to exocytose hormone rather than neurotransmitter or in addition to it. When you're looking at this on models, usually the simplest way of identifying is that it looks sort of like a vaguely weird W shape. Um, the hypothalamus, which is hypo or under the thalamus, um, is involved in pretty much every part of our body function that you can imagine um, that isn't sort of really higher order function. So homeostasis of um, nutrients of uh, interacts with the pineal gland in terms of sleep, thirst, body temperature, water balance, um, and it controls the pituitary gland, which sits in this little cavity in the bone. It's the only uh, endocrine gland that uh, is privileged in that way. And it's connected to the hypothalamus by this bridge of specialized axons. Next, we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum, uh, cerebellum means second tiny brain, and it sits underneath the a little bit of the temporal lobe and under, definitely under the occipital lobe. And um, it's involved in maintenance of posture, muscle tone, balance, um, coordination of body parts. Um, when people talk about uh, motor memory, um, when athletes talk about motor memory, what they're really talking about is training the cerebellum, essentially creating um, strong synaptic pathways so that a particular kind of movement becomes really just automatic. Um, the cerebellum, like the cerebrum, is made inside out. So you have um, gray matter on the outside and um, white matter in the interior and there's a, a very slender stalk that connects the cerebellum into the rest of the brain. Cerebellum has um, lots and lots of white matter, myelinated axons, so much so that um, the pattern that you see of the myelinated axons in sagittal section, or even um, any section you take of the cerebellum, shows something that's called the arbor vitae, which is Latin for tree of life. Last, we have the brain stem, which is responsible for visceral or vegetative functions. So breathing, in terms of respiratory rate, um, heart rate, a number of different kinds of reflexes. And that's shown in red in this image. So we've got a, a lateral view. You can see that the brainstem goes up into, uh, and connects with the diencephalon. Right. And then from in this anterior view, so this is anterior, this one's lateral. In this uh, anterior view, you can actually see places where the cranial nerves come out. And then 
this is the level at which the spinal cord starts. So there are three parts of the brain stem. The confusingly named midbrain, which it sits under the thalamus, snugged up to the hypothalamus, uh, the pons, which I, uh, which is sort of this bump that pops out um, that I put a swirl on to make it more clear. The pons is the bridge between the cerebellum and the rest of the central nervous system. And then the medulla oblongata. Medulla means middle, and oblongata means oblong. <laughs> so it is an oblong-shaped middle. Um, the medulla is where all of the different kinds of reflex centers are for um, different vegetative functions. And the midbrain is another relay station between the spinal cord, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. So you can imagine if sensory information, for example, came in. And so sensory information comes in from, let's say, your shoulders, right? So it comes in one side, and then it actually crosses in the spinal cord. And it's going to go up. It might make a stop and hand off the signal to another cell someplace in the medulla or the pons. It's definitely going to hand a signal off in the midbrain. The midbrain is going to send the signal to the thalamus, and then the thalamus is going to send a signal um, if it's, say, you know, someone is, uh, is touching your shoulder, it's going to send it to primary somatosensory cortex and then from there it's going to get sent to the um, somatosensory association areas. So we'd like you guys to be familiar with just two of the many functional divisions of the central nervous system. The first is called the reticular formation and there are three basic anatomical parts to this. You have um, what are called ascending sensory tracts. So remember inside the central nervous system a tract that refers to a group of axons. Ascending means they're coming, they're heading up to the brain. So you have sensory information coming in. It's handed off to another neuron in an area of the brainstem called the reticular formation. And from there, it's handed off to the thalamus. And then the thalamus sends input to all over the brain. The reticular formation in the brainstem and the, the reticular activating system in particular is responsible for transition between sleep and wakefulness and from being awake and relaxed to being really focused and on high alert. The limbic system is the second functional subdivision of the central nervous system that we'd like you guys to remember. For both the reticular activating system and the limbic system are calling on anatomical structures throughout the central nervous system, okay, to accomplish some kind of function. For the limbic system, the function is really complex. Um, it's involved in learning and memory. It is the seat of our emotion. Um, the seat of anxiety, um, particularly the amygdala. Um, and it's also associated with motivation. So considered part of the limbic system is the hypothalamus, which we've talked about as being anatomically part of the diencephalon. Um, the amygdala, which I just mentioned, 
um, which is the lack of a better word, like that's where anxiety lives. People who have damage to the amygdala uh, are, for lack of a better way of describing it, super chill. It sounds like a great thing, except for that um, when that happens, um, people don't respond to threatening situations in appropriate ways, right? So they're not going to, if somebody pulled a knife out and was like running at them, they would not react appropriately um, and so potentially get quite hurt. The hippocampus, which is this, the pink in this diagram, is the seat of learning and memory. Um, if you've taken a psych class, you might have heard about um, HM. I can't quite remember, which is ironic. Um, what happened if he had a stroke or what the, the issue was, but he had damage to his hippocampus. And although he could remember things from long ago, he was incapable of forming new memories. So every day was like worse than Groundhog Day for him. The thalamus is, as I told you before, a relay to the cortex. In this case, it's going to be relaying information um, from the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus that's putting together our physiological responses with our emotions and our memories. And then finally the cingulate gyrus, which is part of the cerebrum. It's not a good color. Part of the cerebrum. It sits right above part of the hippocampus, and um, that is directly above the corpus callosum. So we have four general areas, anatomical areas of the brain. The cerebrum, which has four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal on the side, the diencephalon, which includes the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the pineal gland, the brainstem, which includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. We talked about two different functional subdivisions <clears throat> of the nervous system, the reticular activating system and the limbic system. In the next video, we're going to dive into the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. Before that, I'm just going to show you this non-animated um, 3D walkthrough of the brain.